Let's conclude this math refresher with two topics. The first is the topic of the derivative of a function of one variable, basically the first derivative. And the second is the exact inverse operator of the derivative. It's called integral, and I'm pretty sure that you have seen it already in the past. We are going to briefly refresh the concept of definite as well as indefinite integrals. Let's start with derivatives. By August 2016, Usain Bolt is the fastest man in 100 meters. So if I consider these two numbers, 9.58 seconds, which is the time that it takes for Bolt to complete running 100 meters, and I take the other number, so 100 meters, and I plot them on a Cartesian plane where on the x-axis I have time, say in seconds, and on the vertical axis, the y-axis I have, say the distance or the position with respect to the starting point of the athlete, I can define these two points. This is at the beginning, this one at the beginning of the race, and this is at the end of the race. Say that I'm interested in calculating the velocity. I would like really to know whether Bolt is faster or slower than uh, my car. I believe it's going to be slower, but uh, definitely it's going to be way faster than what I can run 100 meters. So what I can intuitively do is invoke the concept of average velocity, dividing the uh, change in space, the difference, the delta space, 100 meters, by the difference in time, 9.58 seconds. If I do that, I obtain the familiar concept of average velocity, which is 10.43 meters per second, or if you want to express it in kilometers per hour, you have it here as 37 kilometers per hour, approximately. And this is, in a way, giving a precious indication that, well, I think that driving uh, my car, I can, I can beat Bolt, but definitely walking, I will never, or running, I will never be able to actually uh, compete with him. Now, over the years, people became to be interested in a different concept, not an average velocity, but rather an instantaneous velocity or instantaneous speed or rate of change of quantity. In other words, if I could plot the actual position as a function of time, say that we call it g of t of bolt, I will see that uh, this is quite different than this uh, line that uh, join the two points. For instance, at the beginning, the speed of the athlete is not instantaneous. The guy, although it's exceptional and is the fastest on Earth, cannot really jump start his race at 10.43 meters per second. That's just an average velocity. And towards the end, he's actually peaking its velocity and maybe we'll be able even to stop, like in this case, for a selfie. So the concept here is the instantaneous rate of change. And if I consider just one point, say here, where I consider it might be the peak velocity of, uh, um, of the athlete, I can basically invoke the same concept. A difference in the, in the space, in the distance run, versus a difference in the time, the interval that it took for the athlete to run that amount of space. And here I'm considering not the entire 100 meters, but a portion of it. And the same here, I'm not considering the entire race, but just a portion of it, the corresponding portion of it. But once more, if I divide this delta g by delta t, I have, if you want, an average velocity for this interval within the race. And I can do this for every point of the curve. It is, however, more elegant, and mathematicians provided us with a very important concept, which is the derivative. It's possible to do this uh, instantaneously, so without, re without uh, um, being bounded to the choice of this interval, delta t, which is finite, is uh, not infinitesimal. And here, you actually see the definition of a derivative. And once more, please look at this ratio. It's exactly the same ratio, delta g, divided by the corresponding delta t. So a difference of the position by a difference of the time, so the time taken for these two positions to be, to be joined. And here I have an operator that is called limit, where it says that I call this incremental ratio derivative only when this delta t is made extremely small, so small that it basically converges to zero. 
And surprisingly, or not surprisingly, in calculus, this ratio may still be meaningful when delta t is so small that it's basically zero, and it gives rise to a function. So this is a way to indicate in the so-called Newton notation, g prime, the derivative of g of t, and equivalently we will, we will also use the so-called Leibniz notation, dg <coughs> over dt, and please note that this d might be considered some kind of variation of this delta, that when it gets very small, basically goes to zero, it transforms magically into a d instead of a delta of a Greek letter. Let's try to be more precise. So here I would like to stress that the derivative of a function is itself another function. So the instantaneous velocity of Bolt is a function per se because it changes for each time. And once more, if I provide an input, say the middle race or the end or the beginning, I get a different answer. The velocity, say at the beginning, is going to be very small or zero, and towards the end it might be lower than at the peak in the middle of the race. There is also another, in the literature, another notation with a dot over the symbol f to denote the derivative. And I would like to once more invoke this concept of instantaneous ratio of intervals, invoking the concept of a tangent or the slope to a line tangent to the curve, to the function point by point. So in this animation, you see this line, which is tangent, point by point, so point changing, the slope is going to change, and you see that the derivative is precisely captured by the concept of this slope. Remember in the previous videos, the letter m, the parameter m of the straight function, the derivative is for each x, the parameter m of the straight line that uh, corresponds to the tangent, to the curve in that point, to the function f in that point. Let me run once more so that you can see how the slope is increasing, is becoming zero, is becoming horizontal, is decreasing, is pointing down, pointing upwards again, and so on and so forth. Note that at the maximum it gets flat, it gets parallel. So let me give you a concrete example. I'm considering this function, which is 1 plus the exponential of minus x minus 3, and I'll leave to you the consideration for these additional, for this added constant here, or this uh, subtracted constant here, and the minus here. And this is the function plotted as a function of the of x, say in the interval minus 5 plus 5. I use the website, the function grapher that I indicated and I provided to you. Now let me consider this point here, and let me plot the uh, straight line that is tangent to the curve in that point. And let me continue moving for a point a little bit towards the right. And again, and again, until I reach a plateau. So if I want to plot the slope of these curves, of these lines, sorry, of these straight lines as a function of the horizontal coordinate, I might take each of these lines, take the parameter and plot it point by point, x by x. If I do this, I obtain something which is negative and then it's saturating to zero. Indeed, the slope of those tangent lines were pointing downwards, so being uh, indicative of a negative um, slope, until the point where the slope was becoming zero, so they were becoming horizontal. And here you have numerically translated the same concept. Here is negative, but it's decreasing, decreasing the slope until it gets to zero. Incidentally, it's possible by simple mnemonic rules to calculate analytically the derivative of any function. This is so easy that nowadays computers are actually able to compute derivatives with arbitrary complexity. It's just a kind of automated mechanical process. This is the derivative of this function, and I will show you in a moment why I, uh, the derivative is uh, uh, equal to minus the exponential of minus x minus 3. In order to do so, I would like to present you a list of derivatives of elementary functions. 
If you want, you should think of the plot of the graph of these functions and of the concept of the instantaneous slope to understand what is the derivative of these functions. In this case, I'm considering a constant function and the derivative is zero. Well, indeed, it's actually flat everywhere. So it makes sense that the slope of the line tangent to the curve is going to be always zero. In the case of polynomials or straight lines like x or x to the power n, there are simple rules like indicated uh, here. For a straight line, the slope is always constant and is basically in this case is 1 being x the unitary uh, line dividing the first and the fourth quadrant over Cartesian plane. And in the case of a power, there is this uh, very easy to remember rule where the exponent here is brought uh, to the left of the x and you actually decrease by 1 the exponent. Note that this also work when n is a real number, is 0.5 or minus 0.5 or minus 0.2. An important derivative to remember is the derivative of the natural logarithm, which is 1 divided by x. And similarly, the key derivative that you should remember is the derivative of an exponential. It's so easy to remember because you apply the derivative operator and you get the function itself. Somehow, the exponential growth has a slope that itself is growing exponentially. And finally, for conventional trigonometric uh, functions like sine and cosine, you might have some reminiscence from the high school that the derivative of a sine is the cosine and the derivative of the cosine is minus the derivative of the sine. I think this is all you need in addition to uh, some rule and properties of the derivative. These are indicated here. For instance, if you have to take the derivative of a function which is multiplied by a constant, you simply have the function itself being brought outside the symbol of derivative, so that the result is the constant times the derivative. In the case of a linear combination, which is sum or subtraction, with or without these weighting factors a and b that are constant and can be positive or negative, of course, you actually have that the derivative is a linear operator. So for instance, the sum of derivative, sorry, the derivative of the sum is the sum of derivatives. And the same holds for the linear combination. For the product, there is this uh, chain rule to be remember. So the derivative of a product is the sum of two terms. The derivative of the first factor times the second, and the second is the derivative of the second factor times the first. For a ratio, mnemonically is a little bit more complicated to remember. So the derivative of a ratio is a fraction. At the denominator you have the square of the original denominator, and then the numerator is vaguely rem rem reminiscent of the product rule. So you have the derivative of the numerator times the denominator, and then a minus the derivative of the denominator times the numerator. Finally, the last rule re relates to the so-called compose function. It's also called chain rule, and it's indicated here. The derivative of f of g of x is the product of the derivative where the derivative of the first is taken with respect to the temporary variable, if you want u, where u is equal g of x. And this is the derivative of the inner function, g of x. Let me give you concrete examples also in this case. For multiplication of a constant, the derivative of 3 times sine of x is 3 times the derivative of sine, which is cosine. Very easy. For a linear combination, the derivative of this subtraction between sine and the exponential is the subtraction of the respective derivatives, cosine and the exponential, with the same sign. For a product, here I'm taking the derivative of a fourth power of x times the log 
and by taking the derivative of the first times the second plus the derivative of the second times the first, you might easily prove that this is what you obtain. For a ratio, I take the special case 1 over x to demonstrate that you have to take the square of the denominator and at the numerator you have the derivative of the numerator times the denominator which doesn't survive because the der derivative of the numerator is 0 being 1 a constant minus the numerator times the derivative of the denominator which is 1 times 1 And for the composition of the chain rule, here I'm providing you as an example the derivative of an exponential of minus x divided by a, where a is a constant. So you take the derivative of the uh, outer function, which is the derivative of, of an exponential, which remains the same, e to the minus x divided by a, and then you apply the derivative to the argument, which is minus 1 divided by a, 